Thank you so much uh, for inviting me for this talk. And thank you so much for being so numerous today. Um, I have a lot of things to talk about. Um, but what's interesting in my mind is that these things are linked together in a really interesting way. At least that's what I'll try to convince you about. So the title talks about system two cognition, which is about high level cognition. And that's connected to consciousness, as I'll explain. It's also connected to issues that are very important today in machine learning about generalization out of distribution. And it's also connected to the notion of agency and reinforcement learning and, and uh, how agents face problems that standard um, uh, static machine learning hasn't been looked, looking at enough already. So deep learning has made amazing progress in, in the last few years and decades. And some people think that it might be enough to take what we have and just grow the size of the data sets, the model sizes, computer speed, just get a bigger brain. Um, but I, I'm not quite of, of this uh, opinion. I think that uh, we're missing out in qualitative ways in order to approach human level AI. We have currently machines that learn um, uh, in a narrow, very narrow way, they need uh, much more data to learn a new task than our uh, human examples of intelligence. They need humans to provide high-level concepts through labels, and they still make really stupid mistakes. Uh, they're not very robust to changes in distribution. Uh, they're adversarial examples and things like this. And so some people, uh, contrary to the first ones that I mentioned, think that uh, we have to start afresh, start afresh and uh, invent something completely new to face these challenges and maybe go back to classical AI to deal with things like high-level cognition. What I'll try to tell you about today is that I think there is a path to go from where we are now, uh, expanding the abilities of deep learning to approach these kinds of high-level cognition questions of system two. So, uh, I talked about these two things, system one, system two. Let me try to be a bit more precise. Um, I, I really got introduced to these concepts by reading the amazing book of Daniel Kahneman, which I suggest you to look at, Thinking Fast and Slow. And he talks about these two kinds of cognitive tasks. System one are the kinds of things that we do intuitively, unconsciously, that we can't explain verbally and that we can, in, in a case of uh, behavior, that are habitual. This is what current deep learning is good at. So if you're driving a car and going back home to a place you know, uh, you don't need to pay a lot of attention to the road. You can talk to the person near you. On the other hand, if you're in a new city and uh, you don't know the way, maybe somebody told you uh, directions, but you, you have to really pay attention to every corner uh, you have to read signs, you, you, you have to be on the lookout, and if somebody uh, tries talking to you, you will ask them to, you know, uh, please let me drive. So what's going on there is that you're generalizing in a more powerful way, and uh, you're doing it in a conscious way that potentially you could explain. So if I ask you to add 34 and, and 56, you can do it in your head, but it's going to be sequential and slow compared to a calculator. Um, the kinds of things that we do with System 2 include programming. So we come up with uh, algorithms, recipes, we can plan, we can reason, we can you know, use logic. Usually these things are very slow if you compare to what, for some of these problems, computers could do. Um, and these are the things that I'm going to argue that we want future deep learning to do as well. So um, here are some things that I think we are missing in order to approach human-level AI with deep learning. Uh, we need to work better on out-of-distribution generalization and transfer. So when you learn a new task, you want to be able to do it with uh, very little data. Um, we want to uh, be able to handle these high-level cognitive tasks that I mentioned, including um, using these tasks to force the learner to discover the kind of high-level representations which deep learning was supposed to be about in the first place. You know, deep learning was about learning multiple levels of representation with the highest level supposedly corresponding to the kind of concepts we manipulate with language. And many of these concepts have to do with causality. Uh, the kinds of uh, concepts we manipulate with words tend to be cause or effect. 
Um, and once you start talking about causality, you have to also talk about the agent perspective, something that the mainstream of machine learning hasn't paid enough attention to. Not just because we want to solve reinforcement learning problems, but because we want, to, we want to have machines that understand the world, that build good world models, that understand cause and effect, and uh, that can act in the world in order to acquire knowledge. So a, a big theme of my presentation today is that these different questions are not independent uh, research directions. They are connected. Um, when you make progress in one, you can make progress on the other, and understanding how they are linked can help us um, plan a path for our research. So let me talk a little bit about consciousness and the kind of functionalities that I think uh, we need to add to machine learning. So this is the roadmap for this talk. I'm going to start by talking about the need for uh, having machine learning systems that can handle changes in distribution and why it's particularly important for agents because of non-stationarities in, in their environment. Then I'm going to talk about the building blocks that I think can help us get there. In the last few years, maybe unnoticed, we have added things to the deep learning toolbox, in particular attention mechanisms, which I think are actually the key to move to the next stage that, that, that I'm talking about. And uh, in, in this part of the talk, I'll also tell you a little bit about um, how much work has been done by our colleagues in cognitive neuroscience to better understand human, the human side of the equation. Then I'll talk about several priors um, that may be linked to consciousness. So the main theme here is that uh, there's an advantage for human beings to have these uh, high-level cognitive abilities. And, uh, and so these advantages, you can think of them as assumptions about the world. So usually we talk about uh, priors, or you can think of them as regularization. So the first one that I'll talk about is the idea that the joint distribution between the high-level concepts can be represented by a sparse factor graph. Any joint distribution can be represented by a factor graph, but the sparse one is a different story. And then I'll talk about another uh, prior that has to do with how the world changes. And this is going to connect with the notion of agency. So the fact that uh, most of the time when things change in the world, it's because agents, like people, do something. So we intervene, we do things, and uh, the hypothesis that I'm uh, proposing with other people is to consider those changes as localized in some abstract space. And if, uh, if we use these hypotheses I'm going to show through some of the recent work we've done, you can actually uh, discover relationships that are just causal uh, relationships between variables. Um, yeah, I'm going to also talk about meta-learning, which is connected to the problem of learning out of distribution. And the final bit of my presentation is going to be more about the um, detailed um, architectural structures that we should explore to introduce the kind of compositionality that system two processing requires. And uh, in particular, I think we should be moving towards neural nets that can not just operate on vectors, but also operate on sets of elements, sets of vectors, sets of objects that are pointable, that, that can be referred uh, and uh, operated on by dynamically recombined modules. So that's it. That's, that's the end of my talk. This is the talk, right? Now, <laughs> I'm going to go a little bit more detail on each of these points. Let's start with changes in distribution. So the classical framework for machine learning is based on the hypothesis of IID, independently and identically distributed data. That means the test data has the same distribution as the training data. And, and it's very important because if we didn't have that assumption, then we would not be able to say anything about generalization. Why would a function learned on some data work on some other data, right? Um, now, unfortunately, this assumption is too strong. And, and reality is not like this. Most of the data we get uh, isn't IID, and so in practice, what many people do uh, in industry or in academia is they take, when they collect data, they shuffle it. And, and here, um, to make it IID, and, and here I want to quote my friend Leon Boutou, who uh, in his uh, ICML keynote this year uh, said something like, nature does not shuffle data, we shouldn't. 
And the reason why we shouldn't is because when we do that, we destroy important information about those changes in distribution that are inherent in the data we collect. And instead of destroying that information, we should use it in order to learn how the world changes. So this is important because um, there are, for example, uh, rare events like uh, black swan events that are highly unlikely to happen but could have severe consequences. And um, this question of out of distribution generalization really breaks the IID hypothesis. Now, uh, the IID hypothesis was good, but uh, if we discard it, we need to replace it by something else. And I'm gonna, that's why I've been talking about priors. And one of the important ones is gonna be, well, how is the test distribution gonna be related to our training distribution if it's, if it's not the same? Okay, so let's talk about out of distribution generalization. Um, what I mean by out of distribution generalization is essentially uh, the phenomenon of uh, learner being able to generalize in some way to a different distribution. It doesn't say anything about how we do it. But let's see why we need this. Well, if you are a learning agent, so agent means actions, right? So it's a, it's a learning system that's embedded in some environment. Uh, you, you're almost always facing non-stationarities for several reasons, right? There are changes in distribution due to the actions of the agents. I move to a different place. Uh, the actions of other agents, uh, the fact that you know I'm moving, that the, we're looking at different times, different uh, sensory uh, uh, signals, different sensors, different actuators, different goals, different policies, all kinds of things are changing. And um, as, as you heard from uh, Blaze talk this morning, once we start looking at multi-agent systems, it gets even more complicated. You can't even talk about optimization as he was uh, uh, explaining. Uh, but, but certainly from the point of view of each agent, you don't, you don't have a stationary distribution anymore. Um, and, and if you think about a, a child learning, for example, their world is changing all the time. Their body is changing all the time. Um, and so we need systems that are going to be able to handle those changes and, and do things like continual learning, uh, lifelong learning, and so on. This has been a long-standing goal for machine learning, but I think we haven't yet built the solutions to this. And one of the crucial elements, according to me, in order to be successful in this, and I'll come back at the end of this presentation much more on this, is uh, introducing more forms of compositionality. So, so what, what does that mean? Um, it, it means being able to learn from uh, some finite set of combinations about a, a, a much larger set of combinations. We already get that from distributed representations. Uh, distributed representations are really at the heart of why neural nets are working. They were introduced by Jeff Hinton in the early 80s. And uh, uh, in the last few years, we actually have theory that helps us see why you get an exponential advantage, potentially at least, if, if, the func if, if, if you make the right assumptions, if we're making the right assumptions about the world in terms of compositionality, in terms of being explained by a number of different variables and factors, then the distributed representations can be exponentially advantageous because essentially, once you've trained a bunch of uh, features, you can generalize to new combinations of those features. This is what a single hidden layer already gives you. Now, if you have a deeper network, you also get compositionality because each layer gets composed with the next one. And, and we've also shown that gives another exponential advantage. Now, I think there are other forms of compositionality, and the one that we know best is the one you find in language. And linguists have been, have been talking about this for a long time. They call it systematicity or systematic generalization, and, and, and I'll talk a lot uh, more about that. So this opens the door to better uh, powers of analogy, of abstract reasoning, and, and that remains to be done in, in machine learning, I think. So systematic generalization really is aiming at out of distribution generalization and fast transfer, but, but it's about how we do it. It's about the idea that we can, we can get that by dynamically recombining existing concepts. So it could be in language, but it could be in other settings. Like in, in the picture here from uh, Lake et al. 2015, we invent a new type of vehicle by combining properties of different vehicles. Um, but what's interesting about this is dynamic uh, that systematic generalization allows potentially to generalize to combinations that have zero probability under the training distribution. It's not just that they're not present in the training data, 
then they would have zero probability under the training distribution. So as an example, uh, if I tell you a science fiction scenario, clearly you haven't lived something like this in your life, but you can still imagine it. Um, if, you, if you drive, if you've been living all your life in, in you know, uh, some continent or some city, and then you, you move to a completely different place, and, and you have to drive in this unknown city, as the example I gave earlier, uh, you are also doing a form of systematic generalization. Unfortunately, current neural net architectures are not that good at doing that, and it's been shown through several papers and experiments, uh, starting in particular with the work of uh, Lake and Baroni. Uh, more recently, the work uh, we did at Mila, uh, uh, led by Badano and, and, uh, and collaborators, uh, presented at iClear. Uh, currently, we, we have a paper that's going to be on archive probably tomorrow or the day after on... Um, Clever, which is a data set for visual question answering, where there are combinations of the linguistic concepts that are present in, in the questions that just don't come up in the way that the data is generated. And uh, the current methods, when you ask them to answer these kinds of questions, fail completely, whereas the human wouldn't, you know, we don't even realize that these combinations are not present in, in, in the data. Okay, and then one question people may come up with is how what you're proposing is different from the classical AI program of symbolic logic and so on. So that's a good question. Um, well, I think there are a number of reasons why uh, these, these classical AI programs had trouble. Uh, and in, in the work that we need to do in order to achieve system two performance, uh, we want to avoid some of these pitfalls. Um, we, we want to make sure that those systems will be able to generalize efficiently in, in a large scale. Um, the, the, the concepts that we want to learn need to be grounded in, uh, with system one in, in low level perception and action. We, we want to keep the power of generalization of the distributed representations. We want to make sure that the kind of search that is involved in things like reasoning and planning can be done efficiently, whereas the, the, the classical approaches require a huge number of explorations of uh, many trajectories of how things could unfold or how you could combine concepts, rules, and so on. And finally, we need to make sure we build systems that can properly handle uncertainty in the world, and machine learning has been doing a pretty good job at that up to now. But we want to achieve these extra goals that we're not very doing, doing very well at, like systematic generalization that I explained, uh, uh, factorizing the knowledge, or at least some of it, that the learner is acquiring in small exchangeable pieces to get this combinatorial advantage that I've been talking about. And that includes uh, being able to manipulate variables, uh, things that you do naturally in programming and in, in logic formulations, uh, dealing with instances um, uh, uh, that, that are associated with uh, more general categories, if you want, and uh, you know, having references and indirection, things that don't seem natural in the neural net world. But as I'll try to convince you, we now have actually built the tools for doing that in, in, in deep learning using attention mechanisms. Okay, so let's talk about attention and consciousness. Um, so what is attention? Attention is about doing computation in a focused way. We're gonna sequentially uh, focused computation on one or a few elements at a time. And uh, we realized in around 2014 that this was extremely powerful and, and was the reason why we were able to get a breakthrough in machine translation. When you, when you produce uh, uh, the next word in English, when you're trying to translate from French, say, uh, you want to really focus uh, the computation on just the right few words in, in the French sentence that are relevant to, to do the translation. So we introduced a particular form of attention called content-based soft attention, which is very convenient because you, you can backdrop through it and so you can learn it. In other words, we can learn where to attend. Um, and so the way it works is the computation being done at the next level is gonna use as input um, a, a selection from the previous level of computation uh, and that selection is gonna be a soft selection. So we can take a, a convex weighted combination of value vectors from the previous level and uh, these convex weights are coming from through a softmax that um, is conditioned on uh, each of the elements. So for each of the elements, we're gonna see how well they match the context to see on which one the attention should be focused. So in a way, Attention is parallel, right? We're, we're uh, considering all the possible elements in some set, 
and we're computing a score for each of them in order to decide on which one or which ones we're going to put attention. And there's been recent work in cognitive neuroscience showing that attention should be thought of as, a, as an internal action, right? So the way that your brain is, is attending is very similar to the way that your motor system is deciding to move your arm. And so we want to learn these attention policies. So attention has been very, very um, useful. Um, I mentioned machine translation, but essentially today's NLP systems, uh, state-of-the-art systems, uh, all rely on attention. Uh, look at the, all the work based on transformers and their variations. Uh, they're also at the heart of memory extended neural nets. Uh, we had a paper last year and more ongoing work on how attention um, uh, connected to memory can also unlock the problem of vanishing gradients. And as I'll mention, attention also allows to change neural nets from machines that are processing vectors to machines that are processing sets, and in particular, sets of key value pairs. Okay, so, so let's see this picture again. Uh, we can think of attention as creating a dynamic connection between two layers, whereas in a traditional setting, the connections are fixed. Here, we kind of pick uh, which of the inputs is going to be sent to the, the, the whatever module we're considering that uses an attention mechanism. Now, this is great, um, but from the point of view of the receiving module, there is a problem. Uh, it gets this value, which is uh, one of those in the, sets of, uh, in the set of input elements, but it doesn't know where it's coming from, right? It's the value of what. Um, and so what we're doing in it with attention mechanisms is in addition to the value, we have some concept of key. Uh, in other words, a kind of identifier for where the value coming, is coming from. Currently, we're using those keys to, to decide which element should get the attention. But that key is also sent to the next level. And so downstream computation can know what the value it's getting is, is, is what it is, what it's coming from. Uh, what kind of object it is, what kind of type it is. Uh, so you can think of this as creating a name for these, these objects and creating a form of indirection. And, and, and as I said, now we uh, have these systems of operating on sets. Why is it a set? Because the, the attention mechanism doesn't care of the order in which we're putting these, these elements in, in the first layer. It, it, it just you know, picks one according to how well it matches the, the, some, some kind of learned uh, policy. But uh, the information about the relative position of these elements in, 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 in say, in your brain or in a, in a neural net architecture doesn't matter anymore. Okay, now let's connect to what our friends in neuroscience and, con and cognitive science are, are doing. Um, in our community, the, the C word, consciousness, is still kind of taboo, but, but in their community, it's not anymore. And that's great. Um, they've made a lot of progress in understanding several aspects of consciousness. And there are a number of theories, um, but many of them are related to what's called the global workspace theory, which um, originated from bars, and uh, there's a lot of uh, very good, important uh, improvements to it uh, from Stan DeHaan and collaborators. Um, and what this theory says is that what's going on with, with consciousness is there's a bottleneck of information. Uh, the, some, some elements, uh, of, of uh, what is computed in your brain gets selected and then broadcast to the rest of the brain and influencing the rest of the brain. So um, this is related to short-term memory where the things that have been selected are uh, available and uh, conditions heavily perception and action. So it, it also gives rise naturally to the kind of uh, system two abilities that I've been talking about. All right, so how is machine learning going to do something? I mean, what's the connection with machine learning? Uh, machine learning could be used to help brain scientists better understand consciousness, but, but what we are understanding of consciousness could also help machine learning uh, develop better abilities. So first of all, uh, the work that's been done in neuroscience in general is based on fairly um, qualitative descriptions of, of these functionalities that we, we think uh, are associated with consciousness. Uh, and what machine learning can do is help us formalize in, in a way that's, you know, more mechanistic what, what these exactly means. And, and then that could feed back the, the research in, 
in uh, neuroscience in order to provide specific, more specific tests that could be, could be done of these theories. Um, of course, uh, for me at least, one of the motivations is also to get rid of the sort of fuzzy, fuzziness and magic that, that surrounds the word consciousness. And, and, and I think machine learning is in a good position to provide a justification for these particular forms of computations uh, in the sense of, uh, you know, why, do they, why have they evolved? What kind of computational and statistical advantage are coming with these particular forms of computations? And of course, once we understand these things, we also want them in our learning agents. So consciousness is, is closely related to language because the way that we know that somebody is conscious is by asking them to report what they're thinking about. So this is the, the direct way that we know about consciousness uh, and that means that there's a very strong link between your thoughts, that, you know, things that you're conscious of, and language, that one can be translated to the other fairly easily, although there's a loss of information when you go from your thoughts to, to language. Um, it also means that uh, there's a connection between system one and system two here, because those high-level concepts that we communicate with language um, are anchored uh, in the system one sort of intuitive system that um, connects your brain to uh, uh, the rest of the world through, through perception and action. And, and I think that's one of the big um, uh, important direction for natural language research. Uh, we really want to explore things like grounded language learning where we don't just learn from texts. We learn from environments which involve perception, action, um, the, the, the perception action loop through the environment and, uh, and allow a learner not just to get sort of patterns of sequence of words, but, but also what they refer to is, is, is uh, its understanding potentially implicit of how the world works. And, and I refer you here to some work we've, we've done recently in, uh, published in the last iClear on grounded language learning, uh, something that I, that I called baby AI. Okay, so now we're at the part of my presentation when we, we, I'm gonna tell, talk about the kinds of priors, the kind of structures, uh, the kind of assumptions and regularization that we could use in order to, to encourage our learning systems to uh, do a good job at out of distribution generalization and at the kind of uh, conscious processing abilities that I've been talking about. And the first one uh, I want to talk about is the, the sparse factor graph assumption I mentioned. I called that uh, in a 2017 paper, the consciousness prior. Um, so in this paper, I, I, I talk about the, the way that the, uh, cognitive neuroscience has been understanding conscious processing, the fact that we form these low dimensional conscious thoughts that are obtained by selecting elements from a larger unconscious state, right? So, so now instead of having a single top level representation like we usually have in our systems, uh, we have two. There's the, a very high dimensional unconscious state which contains all of the things you could think about and then there's a tiny, tiny one which only contains those that went through the bottleneck recently. That's the conscious state. Um, and then attention, of course, is used to select uh, from the first one uh, what goes in the second one. And attention is also used in a top-down way to condition further processing uh, in the system one's uh, computation. So now the, that way of thinking about conscious uh, processing is uh, about the sort of computation we're doing, but in machine learning, we're also used to think about what do these computations mean? And often they mean some kind of inference with respect to some model of the world, which might be implicit. And, uh, and, and, and a good way to think about a model of the world includes what's, what kind of joint distribution between the high-level concepts are we talking about? And so the consciousness prior uh, uh, proposes that it's a sparse factor graph. So a, a factor graph is just a, a particular representation of joint distributions. You can represent any joint distribution in this way. It has these uh, squares that correspond to factors that are kind of relations between variables. The nodes are other variables. And uh, sparsity here just has to do with how many uh, neighbors each node has. Um, so why, why do I think that it's a good hypothesis? Well, think about the, the kind of statements we can make with natural language. Like when I say, 
if I drop the ball, it will fall on the ground. Now, this is a, a very powerful statement because it's true with high probability, and yet it involves very few variables, just the, just the words that are there. Um, and uh, so the, the fact that it uses very few words means that the, the relationships that are being de described um, can tightly capture some element of the joint probability uh, through very few variables at a time. So you can think of like each of these black squares, each factor corresponding to the relationship between a small set of variables of the kind you could produce with natural language. Now, this is different from the usual assumption that you find in many papers these days that study high-level representations uh, that are supposed to be, in, where the variables are supposed to be independent of each other. This so-called disentangling work, which uh, I think is a, is a misunderstanding of uh, the goals of deep learning, which was to learn these high-level representations. And, and so uh, instead of thinking of these variables as completely independent at the top level, uh, we think of them as having this very, very structured joint distribution. Um, and, and, and they have to be like this because uh, high-level concepts like, say, ball and hen that I just used are not independent. They, they come in these very powerful and strong relationships, as I showed. So, so then um, what I'm saying is instead of imposing the very strong prior of uh, complete marginal independence at the high level, we can, we can have this uh, slightly weaker prior but still very strong prior uh, that the joint is represented by a sparse factor of. The reason I say it's still very strong is that this prior, for example, would not work in the space of pixels. Um, you can't find uh, easily uh, a, a small group of five pixels in, in images such that uh, you can predict one of the pixels uh, with high accuracy given, given the four others. But we can do that with natural language when we express those statements uh, in this, at this high level. So, so factor graphs are expressed by uh, writing the joint as a product of uh, these uh, partition functions like the phi k here, where each of these partition functions involves only a few subsets of the variables. And so what it means if we were to impose something like this is it puts pressure on the encoder, say, that maps the low-level data to the high-level representations uh, to have that property that, that uh, the factor graph is sparse. Okay. So, so next, I want to talk about the, the meta-learning aspect and uh, another hypothesis um, that's important to deal with how the world changes. So meta-learning uh, is, is something really hot and cool these days, but actually started uh, several decades ago. Uh, my brother and, and I have been working on this in the early uh, 90s and actually was uh, Sami's uh, PhD subject. Um, and, and what it's about really is about having multiple timescales of learning or multiple timescales of um, iterative uh, optimization like uh, computation. So typically you would have an inner loop like normal learning and an outer loop like evolution, which optimizes whatever the inner loop is, is producing. And so in this way, we can uh, talk about uh, the uh, evolution outer loop with individual learning in the loop, or we can talk about uh, in the life of an individual lifetime learning as the outer loop and individual adaptation to a new environment as, as the uh, fast time scale. And the thing that's cool about meta-learning is it allows us to explicitly optimize for generalization. And in particular, it can be used to explicitly optimize for out-of-distribution generalization, right? If the agent sees multiple environments, um, we, can, we can train its uh, slow time scale meta-parameters so that it will generalize well to new uh, environments. Now, uh, th there's the question of, uh, that I mentioned earlier, what kind of hypothesis can we make about these changes in distribution? And because underlying physics um, means that uh, typically an action by an agent is gonna be localized in space and time, uh, we can assume that the changes uh, in distribution correspond to or are caused by, or the consequence of an intervention by an agent that uh, acts on just a few causes or a few mechanisms that relate variables uh, with each other. So this extends a, a hypothesis that was proposed by uh, Shopkov and collaborators of uh, independent mechanisms. And he, what they mean here is informationally independent, meaning that the, 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 the relationships between variables, the mechanisms, the conditional distributions uh, are independent in a sense that what you learn from one doesn't tell you anything about another one. 
And so if something changes in the world, one of these mechanisms changes, one of the conditional distributions corresponding to, say, one of the nodes in this graph, uh, it's like a graphical model, for example, if something like this changes due to an intervention, um, you only need to adapt the, the part of the model that corresponds to the change. So, for example, if I uh, put on some sunglasses, uh, the data that I'm getting at my, uh, on, uh, on my retina is, is very, very different. But it can be explained by a tiny change, which is this one variable that you know, changes its value from uh, 0 to 1. So uh, that, that's really interesting because if we have such a uh, hypothesis and we have a good representations of uh, the interactions between all those high-level variables, then uh, very few bits would be needed to account for those changes. And, and thus, very few observations needed to uh, uh, adapt or infer what, what has happened. And thus, we can get good out of this regionalization. So, uh, so the idea is, since uh, out of this regionalization can be uh, um, uh, obtained if we have the right decomposition of knowledge, uh, we can use out of distribution performance as a training signal for factorizing knowledge. Okay, so uh, we did some work in that direction. Uh, there's a paper called the Meta Transfer Objective for Learning to Disentangle Causal Mechanisms, where we applied this idea in a very simple settings where you have just two variables A and B, or um, uh, say four variables A, B, X, Y, and um, A is the cause of B, but the learner doesn't know, and you might observe just X and Y, which are simple uh, like rotations of A and B. And it turns out that uh, if you have the right decomposition, if you, um, um, if you look at uh, the, the right way of factorizing the joint distribution between A and B, the one in which um, we have P of A, the cause, multiplied by P of B given A um, for, for the effect given the cause, then uh, when there's a change in distribution due to an intervention on the cause, the, the learner that has the right model uh, will adapt much faster, doesn't need as much data. So the x-axis on this thing is the amount of data that the learner needs to recover from a change in P of A. And it turns out that you can also use this to learn about uh, how to map the xy, which is things like the pixels, that don't have a causal structure, to the A's and B's that, that are the high-level variables that have causal structure. Because, again, uh, the same remark as I did earlier with uh, the consciousness prior, which does not apply on the pixel level, the assumption that uh, uh, these high-level variables are causal does not work on, on things like pixels. Uh, you can't really find a pixel that's a cause of another pixel, right? So it's not the right space for doing things. Um, we had a more recent paper called Learning Neural Causal Models from Unknown Interventions, where we extend these ideas to larger graphs uh, in such a way that we can avoid the exponential explosion of the number of graphs that need to be considered by parameterizing uh, in a factorized way the distribution over graphs. And one of the things we find is that in order to really facilitate the, 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 the learning of the causal structure, uh, the learner should try to infer what was the uh, intervention, on which variable uh, was the change uh, performed. And uh, that's something we do all the time. Like uh, most of the time, at least my brain is trying to figure out what was the cause of what I've uh, observed uh, or that explained the change that I, I'm seeing. So we, we tested these ideas on, on, on various uh, small graphs. And we were able to find that uh, actually this, this works quite well and better this, uh, than the uh, uh, commonly used causal induction methods. Uh, but more importantly, the, the way that we are attacking this problem is something that's very deep learning friendly in the sense that we just define uh, an overall objective, uh, some regularization terms, the usual things, and we do gradient descent on it. Okay, um, the last bit of my presentation is about operating on sets of objects that may be pointable using dynamically recombined modules, which I, I promised uh, at the beginning. Um, and so we have another recent paper called RIMS for recurrent independent mechanisms. And uh, it's about modularizing the computation and operating on these sets of uh, named and typed objects, but in a, in a, in a deep learning way, as you'll see. So we, we, we apply this idea to recurrent nets. The state of the recurrent net is broken into pieces 
me see if this works. Um, uh, all right. So, so each of these boxes represent uh, a, a, a small recurrent net that is updated based on its previous state, but it can also be updated based on the state of other uh, subnetworks. But we are constraining the way that these subnetworks are talking to each other so that it's going to be sparse and it's going to be done in a dynamic way. So what it means is that um, uh, uh, using attention mechanisms, the, 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 the connectivity pattern between those, those modules is, is changed and, and, and uh, computed on the fly. Also, we use uh, the attention mechanisms to select a subset of the modules that are going to be activated. So this is the idea that there's a bottleneck um, that dominates the computation. And, uh, and the other important element is that the things that are communicated between those subnetworks are not the usual standard vectors that we use in recurrent nets. They are these sets of key value pairs. Um, and so what it means is that what these networks are exchanging is, uh, you can think of them as uh, variables uh, along with uh, something like their type. And what we found is that this leads to better out of distribution generalization than uh, standard uh, methods that, that don't use these kind of uh, structures. Uh, we've also tested this in uh, reinforcement learning setups where we just replaced LSTMs that were used in, in a PPO baseline for Atari games and found that it helped on the, uh, on the majority of the Atari games. Okay, so we're close to the end of my presentation. Now let me recap some of the hypotheses for conscious processing by agents and systematic generalization that I'm, I'm proposing we pay more attention to. So I mentioned the, the, the consciousness prior, this idea that there would be a sparse factor graph relating the joint distribution between the high-level semantic variables. Uh, I suggested that these high-level variables, for the most part, can be considered as causal variables, that they can be cause or effect of each other. And what it means really is that they, they are about agents, they are about intentions, and they are about objects that are controllable and, and their attributes. Um, one thing I didn't talk about um, is that those, um, those relationships between variables, they, they, um, they, are, they don't have their own uh, parameters for each uh, uh, factor of the graph for each potential function. Instead, they should be um, shared uh, modules that can be reused across different tuples. So the fact that we have these key value pairs, uh, that means that uh, a particular, say, subnetwork is going to receive input uh, that's going to be different depending on the context. And so it's like if it's a, a, a little rule, but of course it's, it's a neural net, that um, is going to be applied to different instances so the, 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 the graphical model that I'm talking about is, is more like a dynamic base net where the same uh, parameters can be reused in many, many places. And of course, this is also connected to uh, Markov logic networks that uh, Domingos proposed a long time ago. Um, another really important hypothesis that I spend time on is the idea that the changes in distribution are um, mostly uh, localized if you represent information in the right way. Uh, this is semantic space. So that's another property of that semantic space. And one thing I didn't spend much time on, but that, for example, Arjovsky and Botu have talked about in their recent paper, is that the things that are preserved across those changes in distribution have to do the, with the stable properties of the world. Um, that would, could be, for example, grounded by an encoder, a system one uh, aspect uh, that captured the stable and, 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 and robust aspects of, of the world. So to conclude, um, I think after um, decades of work on consciousness by contemporary science, it's time that machine learning look at these questions and explore the functionalities and, and, and the justifications for having these kinds of capabilities. Um, and I think that uh, this would bring new priors that could help systematic generalization and out of distribution generalization. It could benefit, of course, uh, neuroscience because we would be able to provide more detailed account of these functionalities that can then be tested in, in real people or animals. And it would allow to expand deep learning from system one to system two. So thank you. Thank you very much, Joshua, for this great talk. So please, if you have questions, 
Come on the left side or the right side, close to the mic. Hi. Hey. Um, so you're talking about consciousness, and this is something I think that's really interesting. Um, I think there's actually pretty broad consensus among moral philosophers that uh, con having conscious experience is an important part of what makes one a moral patient, um, in, order, in other words, like deserving of moral consideration. Um, and then philosophers also like to talk about like, the easy problem of consciousness versus the hard problem of consciousness. And I'm kind of just wondering you know, what your thoughts are on the moral implications of building machines that may be conscious, and if you think the way that you're talking about consciousness uh, has any relevance to that kind of question, and also if you think that there's a way that you see for us to determine whether or not AI systems that we're building are having subjective experiences that make them relevant moral patients. So today, I've only talked about the easy problem of consciousness. There is the question of subjective experience, which I haven't talked about, and deserves much more work and attention. But on the neuroscience side, people uh, have been thinking about this for much longer. And there are some interesting theories which I think connect to issues of um, uh, self-knowledge and uh, predicting our own actions, which uh, might explain the, 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 the impression of subjective experience. So, um, over here. The other major theory of, of consciousness is, of course, integrated information theory, which measures consciousness by this phi quantity, yes. which is essentially a measure of the mutual information of the parts of a system. And the higher the mutual information, the more consciousness you have, which seems like the polar opposite of your sparse factor graph hypothesis. How do you reconcile the two? I don't. Um, so I think the IAT theory is uh, uh, more on the mystical side of things and you know, attributes consciousness to any atom in the universe. And I'm more interested in the kind of consciousness that we can actually see in brains. No, but they measure consciousness by this well, five measure they, they, in brains yes, and there, in computers. Yes, there's a quantity that is being measured, but I don't think it's related to the kind of uh, computational abilities that I've been talking about. Hi, here. Uh, um, thank you for the very inspirational talk. My question is regarding uh, so the, the topics that you touched upon, uh, the prior part and also the factorization part. So um, in recent cognition um, work, um, it has also been shown that the human mind kind of uses the, the spatial world where we navigate as kind of a prior to sort our thoughts. Um, it, this has been recently summarized also in the book by Barbara Tversky. If, if, I don't know if you're familiar with that. But uh, th my question is, do you see like, a role for, for this kind of uh, like spatial prior or like a, a way to organize certain concepts? Like, how could we uh, go about this? Yeah, yeah, possibly. I think uh, one of the big lessons of uh, the last few decades of machine learning is we need all kinds of priors in order to encourage good solutions to the problems we're looking at. And clearly the brain is exploiting uh, the fact that a very important aspect of the world is the, the spatial structure. Uh, of course, some of our models do, but I think on, on the conscious side and memory side, uh, these are uh, also important, but I haven't looked at that. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, over here. <clears throat> yeah. uh, I'm inspired and also heartened to see that you're exploring how to integrate some aspects of as you, what you put the symbolic program into deep learning and so on. Um, I guess my question is how far you anticipate that going? There's been a lot of work, for example, on extending logic programming, which is far more powerful than just knowledge graphs or graphs or hypergraphs, to have numerical uncertainty, including scalably, computationally scalably. So that might involve interleaving fine grain these kinds of symbolic reasoning techniques with neural network type learning and inference as it's usually conceived of in neural net or machine learning terms. So how much of that, how soon do you think there ought to be? Well, so indeed there are a lot of people who have been exploring how we could kind of paste the uh, symbolic logic tools on top of the neural net computation. 
Um, I don't think this will work. Um, what I'm talking about is interleaving it yeah. more tightly as opposed to just bolting it on before or after. Yeah, but so what I'm talking about is different. And, and yeah, of course, I've, you know, I don't know what will work. I don't have a crystal ball. But what I'm talking about is more implementing uh, some of the functionalities of, of, of logic and, and, and reasoning with the neural net machinery um, in the hope of keeping uh, you know, both properties. And, and one place I didn't have time to talk about where this matters is in the search. So in, in classical AI, a big, op big obstacle is we have to look through a, a, a potentially exponentially large number of potential uh, trajectories or combinations of things. And that's where system one, which is the, the neural net thing, comes in, right? So we learn um, what to attend to, uh, what to think about, but it happens out of our consciousness. We don't know why we think about something, but that's crucial to enable efficient reasoning and search and planning and so on. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, we can talk more about it later. Thanks, Yasha, for a great talk. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what is a data distribution and how we know if we're in it or out of it and how the data distribution, uh, like what is the relationship between the data distribution and the empirical distribution? Like how, given a training set, can we exactly characterize what is the underlying distribution of that data? Well, obviously we don't have access to the data distribution, except if we're doing machine learning experiments and we sort of cheat and, and you know, synthesize the data from some um, handmade distribution. Um, and so we can do it mathematically, we can do it in simulations where we know what it is and it's very useful. But I think we also have to think about uh, maybe how that distribution came about as a uh, non-stationary process with, where things change in the world. And sometimes what looks like a distribution can be broken down into sub-distributions that, that are related. Think about data coming from different places or different times, for example. And, and we don't pay enough attention to that right now. Hi, uh, quick question. Uh, so you made a call to move beyond just perception to high level reasoning and consciousness. And the question is, how do we actually measure progress towards that goal? Um, so I talked about out of distribution generalization, right? And things like transfer learning, uh, few shot learning, uh, uh, continual uh, learning and so on have benchmarks, which I think is a good starting point. But, but in general, especially if we introduce the, the agent aspect, uh, we, I think we have to start thinking about building environments in which we're gonna test how well our learner can cope with those changes in distribution when those changes are not uh, like a, a, a simple set of distributions like we do right now in standard meta-learning benchmarks, for example. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm here. Um, so you set these high-level high uh, semantic variables. You said, in, in one point you said they're in a factor graph, and yes. then you also said they're causal. Yes. But Usually the causal one, causal variables, we uh, put them into DAGs. Yes. So, how, yeah, how, can you say something on the relation? Yeah, just put arrows on the factor graph. And that works. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, so you, you have the joint distribution structure, and, and the causality is just another thing on top, which provides extra information, and these are the arrows. Uh, I mean, there could be a longer answer, but that's the short answer. Uh, hi. Over here, uh, to the right. Um, hi, so uh, great talk, thank you. Uh, my question is what relationship you see between sparse factor graphs and uh, relational and associative memory supported by the hippocampus in humans, given that humans with bilateral hippocampal removal appear to be able to be conscious but not flexibly use relational associations? Hmm, that's interesting, I didn't know about it. Um, so I, 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 I don't know, I, I guess uh, maybe you need that um, uh, attention going back and forth between the two sides of the brain in order to to coordinate um, the uh, different elements of, say, a relation. So, so one thing uh, maybe that has been misleading in my picture is I've drawn the conscious state as if it was some something that was physically separate from the unconscious state, but in the brain, that's not how it, it is. It's more like within, you know, the brain, uh, the unconscious part, there's some some subset of, of neurons become uh, 
excited a lot more and others become inhibited. So, and, and of course, that goes through a global communication. So if you break the global communication, I could imagine it would, it would hurt the whole thing. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I, I propose you ask your questions during the coffee break, and we are going to thank again Yoshia.